All right, we uh, pick up where we left off uh, in our church history study um, last week, actually. Um, we were talking about Desiderius Erasmus, uh, the only person I've ever known in church history by the name of Desiderius, but um, um, we had looked a little bit uh, at the his production of his Greek New Testament because that's really where most... Most of us have been most have been most greatly impacted by him. Would be in uh, the production of what eventually becomes known as the Textus Receptus or the TR. Uh, there is a movement, even amongst Reformed Baptists today, to to go back to that. Um, if you'd like to uh, see a discussion of something similar to that, I did a debate book uh, last year with uh, Doug Wilson, who is a um, ecclesiastical text advocate, uh, which is similar to being a TR advocate. Uh, so we, we mentioned all that last week. But I didn't give you much in the way of uh, personal information about uh, Erasmus himself because he was a very interesting individual. Um, he was the illegitimate son of a priest. Now, unfortunately, uh, that was not overly unusual in that day, um, but it did require of you to obtain a special indulgence or uh, variance or something for your, you yourself to become involved in ministry. Uh, Erasmus was an ordained Roman Catholic priest, and he died in communion with the Church of Rome. And so... Uh, when we when we talk about Erasmus, we talk about his uh, satirical criticism of the relics trade. Remember last week we mentioned, you know, he may not have been the origin of the statement, but certainly uh, uh, repeated and said very many similar things to you could you know, build an entire ship out of all the genuine pieces of the cross that were floating around Europe at that time. And he was uh, critical of the, the lax clergy and uh, the general uh, gullibility um, of the people, even though, as I mentioned last week again, he was part of a very, you know, he's, even as a, the, the Dutch humanist, the, the prince of the humanists, um, he still, um, when writing uh, at one point, uh, working on his work during the summer, they didn't have air conditioning back then, uh, was being bothered by mis a number of mosquitoes. And uh, he made comment that these were demons that were seeking to distract him from his work. And that wasn't, you know, you may think of that. I, uh, every once in a while, we'll get these uh, blood-sucking leeches in, in our house. And, uh, uh, man, I, I just can't find them. The, 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 you know one of the real bummers about getting old is you can't see them anymore. Um, you know, uh, they're too small to see a distance. And once they get close, is that one of my floaters or is that a mosquito? I don't know. So you, <laughs> you're spending you know, you're half your time swatting at your own, uh, your own, uh, own stuff floating around your own eye. Uh, it's, it's a bummer. And, uh, you know, they just love me. I guess, I, I guess my blood tastes good or something like that. And uh, so it's, it'd be easy to say these demons are bothering me, but he actually meant it. And so, um, you know, we, we look at him, and, and we have to put him in the, in the time that he lived, but he was a Roman Catholic priest. And we, we hear him criticizing excesses in Roman Catholicism, and there were many in the Reformation that expected him to come over and to, to leave Roman Catholicism. He did not. And even though he debated uh, you know, Luther on the bondage of the will and clearly had sympathies uh, toward much of what the reformers were saying, and uh, there are a number of his books um, that are uh, very Christ-centered, uh, very focused upon uh, the supremacy of Christ and things like that. Yet he also writes a book in defense of transubstantiation, and so it is ironic to me. Uh, you know, I've I've had to deal with the King James only movement a lot over the years, and. And it's uh, always been ironic to me that uh, many of these individuals will just sing the praises of Erasmus while at the same time 
uh, the modern uh, Greek text uh, that is utilized by pretty much everyone today in scholarship. Um, there are it is an international, interreligious group that is involved in doing the work on that, which included uh, Cardinal uh, Mario Martini, uh, a Roman Catholic. And they'll go, see, there, there it is. If you use that Greek text, psh, you're, 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 you're a Jesuit. And uh, you can go online right now and find numerous uh, videos identifying me as a Jesuit uh, as well. So, um, but the problem is their own text came from a Roman Catholic priest that wrote a book in defense of transubstantiation. And, and they, don't, they don't see the, the, the contradiction between doing, you know, holding those two different, different positions. Um, and so when we, um, when we look at uh, Erasmus, we are really... Uh, faced with a, a lot of questions as to exactly how to evaluate him as an individual. There, there are times when you, when you go, yay, Erasmus. And then there are times you go, wow, there's, there's that coming humanism. And then there are other times you go, uh, you know, there's, there's Roman Catholicism. And uh, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real mixture. And you run into a lot of that at the time of the Reformation. Uh, it's just... There's no way to, to get around that. So uh, Erasmus is, um, is a fascinating character uh, to look at in, in church history. And uh, it's just one of those many situations where you can be reading along and you go, oh, this is good, this is good, this is good, whoop, that isn't, oh, this is good, this is good, whoop, that isn't. And, you know, uh, the, the tendency is always to try to do long-distance chronologically impossible mind reading and soul reading. Uh, you know, you just honestly deal with the man as he was and, and uh, leave the rest to, re- read the less, leave the rest to, to God. So, uh, but what's extremely important, this is in the section of stuff that was necessary for the Reformation. And as we will see, uh, that first edition of the, and let's see if anybody was awake last week or is awake this week. Um, what was uh, Erasmus's uh, text first called? Sean, you've got competition. Das ist aber richtig, mein Herr. The Novum Instrumentum, the new instrument, uh, which is, you know, uh, just a, another Latin way of referring to the uh, the Berith, the uh, Covenant, um, and it was a diglot. And as I mentioned before, uh, initially Erasmus was considerably more focused on the Latin that he was providing because it wasn't the Vulgate, uh, and more concerned about what he was going to, how he was going to get attacked for that. That shifted over time to the Greek, as that became uh, the centerpiece of the reformers argumentation, not, not the Latin. I mean, to be honest with you, his Latin translation went nowhere um, because it came right at the beginning of the Reformation, a little bit before the Reformation. And so once the Reformation starts, then the, the, the focus shifts and the Reformed are focused upon the Greek text and the resultant reaction on, the, on Rome's part is to double down on the Latin Vulgate as the official translation of the church. Um, now, that's not Rome's position anymore, uh, but it was then. Uh, for quite some time, that was, that was Rome's position. And in fact, uh, you'll end up with uh, Pope Sixtus, the Latin numeral after his name, fifth, sixth, I can't remember which one it was. Somewhere fourth, fifth, sixth, Pope, Pope Sixtus comes out with uh, infallible Vulgate. Um, which had to immediately be withdrawn because it was filled with so many, so many errors. So um, they, they learned their lesson. And, and uh, in fact, what, what is interesting, and you, you see this if, if uh, I just got a, got a cool thought. And what's scary is it's a really cool thought, but I'm not sure that I'll still have it at the end of class. <laughs> that's, that's, that's frightening. I want to do that. But at the end of class, I'm going to go, now what was it I was thinking about doing? And it's just this way it goes. Um, but if you will read, um, uh, and I, I would just highly recommend to everybody, if you're looking 
to um, put a real valuable historical and theological resource in your library. Uh, the three volumes uh, called the Institutes of Elenctic Theology by Francis Turretin. Uh, Turretin is a um, couple gener- two generations from from Calvin, approximately um, reformed scholastic. Uh, it's in the form of questions and answers. A lot of writing back then was, and it's really sort of the height of uh, Reformed orthodoxy. But Rome has launched the Counter-Reformation by that point in time, and it's been going for a number of decades, uh, well, more longer than that. And so he's responding to a lot of the things that the Jesuits have developed. You know, Jesuits today are known for being ultra-liberals, uh, but back then, they were, they were the ultra-conservative, um, founded by a man by the name of Ignatius Loyola, and uh, not to be confused with Ignatius of Antioch. Um, they're only, you know, 1,400, 1,500 years apart. Um, but, uh, you know, who was uh, known to, to say that if, the, if the, the Pope were to declare anything to be black, which to our eyes appears white, we should proclaim it to be black. Um, the Pope is the final authority. And what's interesting is Rome's approach for quite some time, it's, it's, it's still this way today, but from a different perspective. Rome's approach for quite some time was to attack the Reformation by saying that without us, you can have no real knowledge of the Bible. Not the interpretation of the Bible, but the text of the Bible. And so they would focus upon differences in manuscripts and things like that. And it's, it's funny, it was the Jesuits who were really behind that, but you take it to its final conclusion and it destroys their own position. I mean, literally, if, 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 you know, if you've ever seen the, the, some of those cartoons on the internet of, of someone vigorously sawing away on the branch that they're sitting on, uh, that's, that's what the Jesuits were doing. Um, and so you'll find a bunch of stuff in Turretin. And there, there is a point where the, the Reformed Orthodox sort of do something like in the early church. Remember, if you remember in the early church, when the, the Orthodox were being challenged by the Gnostics and stuff, some in the early church started grabbing hold of the concept of apostolic tradition, succession, and authority to try to say, well, our churches go back to the apostles, yours don't. Um, which, of course, the, you know, the Gnostics were more than happy to come up with ways of saying that theirs did. So, um, but something similar happens amongst the Reformed to where uh, they start defaulting back to a traditional text um, uh, as a means of defending against these things. Now, we, we don't have to do that today because we've got a whole lot more information about the, an- the antiquity of the text. We have many more manuscripts than they had back then, many older manuscripts. And even Rome has gone, eh, well, we tried and has moved on from there and isn't making that kind of a, an argument any longer. But um, uh, it, is, it is fascinating to, to observe that and to what comes of Erasmus's text. Now, the last uh, element of the, uh, of the uh, background information, this is the, this is the last sub- subheading before the Reformation. At least in my notes, not that we couldn't do a ton of other things. And that is uh, corruption in the church. Now, we, we've seen the Avignon papacy. We've seen the Babylonian captivity of the church. But there was, uh, it, it wasn't to quite the same level as the pornocracy, if you recall that in the uh, ninth and 10th centuries. Um, but... Uh, there was a tremendous amount of, of corruption in the church. And this, you know, this, this becomes clear, for example, in Luther's own personal experience. He, in 1510, he, he goes to Rome on, on business for the Augustinian order. And uh, at, at one point, he sees the Pope uh, riding through the streets of Rome in a full suit of armor, uh, sword and lance in, in, uh, in, in hand uh, with... Uh, with his entourage, not of, of penitent monks, but of, of armed soldiers. And the, the corruption that he sees in Rome 
um, obviously is is one of the many factors uh, that leads him to recognize the need for for reformation. And so uh, this was the case for many people. Um, the 15th century saw a tremendous decline in the papacy, um, even lower than that point reached in the Avignon period. Uh, the papal office was bought and sold to the highest bidder, and everybody knew it. Uh, you, if, you want, if, if you were a cardinal, uh, you were in the running, um, but you had to have tremendous financial resources. And of course, as a cardinal, you would be over numerous bishops, uh, we're going to see later, uh, you know, one of the big, big, big stories we'll get to just in, in, in a very short period of time. Um, Albrecht wants to become the Archbishop of Mainz. Well, he's, he's already got too many bishoprics, according to church law. Um, and so he has to buy a, a very, very expensive variance uh, from Rome. And uh, it was uh, 300,000 ducats. And uh, I was, when we were in Germany last year, I wondered, what is that in modern money? And it was about $1.6 million uh, he had to borrow uh, to buy his position. That's just an archbishop. That's not a cardinal. So that the cardinals are, uh, you know, would be, would be in Trump's league, you know. Uh, they'd be bopping around with, uh, with, with the real rich folks. And... Um, so uh, everybody knew that whoever became pope uh, had had to leverage himself tremendously in the process of, of uh, uh, obtaining that position. Um, and uh, uh, actually it was 30,000 ducats, not 300,000, but it still ends up being over a million bucks. An entire series of corrupt popes damaged the prestige of the papal office. Innocent the Eighth. I just love that that name, Innocent. Um, it, it's just why anybody would ever take that name is truly uh, beyond me. 1484 to 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, uh, had a number of illegitimate children prior to his being made pope. He used his influence to have them married into rich families after taking the chair of St. Peter. Innocent was basically controlled by... Giuliano della Rovera, who became Julius II. Uh, Innocent was followed by Alexander VI, better known as Rodrigo Borgia. Yes, you've heard of the Borgia popes. Well, Alexander VI, uh, loaded with benefices. Now, benefice is, uh, Calvin had a benefice. Um, you could be given positions in the church that would pay a certain amount of money. And this, this was basically, they basically turned into scholarships. You could go to university and stuff. But you technically were like a priest or even a bishop. And then you, that would pay X amount of money. And so you would take part of that and pay some priest to do what you're supposed to be doing in that place while you're off doing something else. And... Technically, you're only supposed to have like one of those, but that was the, that's just a technicality. Uh, the more of them you could get, the more money you could make. And so uh, Rodrigo Borgia, uh, Alexander VI, loaded with benefices from his youth. He was the second richest cardinal at his ascension to the papacy. Uh, he lived, uh, and, and so, so I mean, these people were the mega rich of of that day. I mean, they had houses and land, and and fared sumptuously, and so on and so forth. He lived an openly licentious lifestyle by numerous women. Uh, some of his more famous offspring include Juan, Cesar, and yes, Lucrezia, Lucrezia Borgia. Yeah, that's, that's where this comes from. Um, uh, Borgia simply bought the papacy by bribing many of the cardinals to vote for him. Upon becoming pope, he made his 17-year-old son, Caesar, bishop of several sees. Uh, Lucretia was married a number of times to rich and powerful men. And in the absence of Borgia, she virtually ran the papal office. So when he was off on vacation, 
uh, Lucretia ran stuff. Uh, that's how it was done. Uh, Borgia continued his sexual affairs even while Pope, and he died in 1503. Vast majority of historians believe that he was poisoned, uh, which was how you moved up in the ranks uh, back then uh, in, uh, in the papacy. Um, Alexander's arch rival became Julius II, again by bribery and promises. Uh, and he began the construction of St. Peter's Basilica in 1506. Now, uh, how many of you have, uh, have any of you been to St. Peter's in, in Rome? Got uh, a couple of people willing to put their hands up and say, yes, I've actually uh, been there. Uh, I have too, and I got into a lot of trouble by uh, basically uh, commenting on social media back then, uh, which was not what social media is today, but still writing a blog post uh, about just the gaudiness of it all. I mean, it just, uh, you eventually just get overwhelmed by marble and statues, and, and uh, there's all these crypts of the various popes in there. They're just, just so outrageously ornate um, that it, it, after a while, it, it just looks almost fake because there's so much of it. And um, uh, so anyway, so now, now think of the timing here. Um, the Reformation begins 1517. This is 1506. This is only 11 years. Uh, Luther is already studying and in school and so on and so forth uh, at this point in time. And, and, um, uh, so we're, we're talking immediately prior uh, to to this, and in fact, it's going to be uh, Julius the uh, uh, the second um, who is the one that um, Luther is going to see riding in full armor in uh, in Rome in 1510, and uh, it is the need for money to build St. Peter's uh, that leads. Eventually, is is part of the the, the background uh, to a certain man by the name of Johann Tetzel coming into Saxony to sell indulgences, and so you can see where where the connection uh, where we're, where we're going here. Um, he uh, uh, Julius is the one who proclaimed a special indulgence to help pay for the expensive building project uh, by means of war. He was a warrior. Uh, interdict. Remember, that's where the, the Pope says to, a, to the clergy in a certain area, you can no longer marry him or bury him or baptize him or anything else. And excommunication, Julius subdued Bologna and Venice, which were obviously um, great rivals to Roman power in the boot of Italy. Uh, creating the Holy League, he removed French power at Ravenna in 1512. So he's a real politician. Uh, these activities earned him the name of Pontifus Terrible, the terrible or, or ferocious pontiff. Uh, Julius was succeeded by Leo X. Leo X reigns from 1513 to 1521, which means Leo X is the pope of the Reformation. The Reformation begins under Leo X. And uh, I suppose I should tell the story now before we actually get into um, the Reformation material. But I made mention of something last week, and I, as I mentioned it, I may have said we'll talk more about that later. Or I, I just remember clearly thinking, someone may go, that doesn't make any sense. So I want to clear something up from last week and also tie it in here with Leo X. Um, Remember, we were talking about uh, Erasmus and how he was rushing uh, to put together his Greek New Testament because his printer, John Froben, knew that um, Cardinal Jimenez, and there are some people that say that, that Jimenez is sort of the modern way of, it's X-I-M-E-N-E-S. Some say that's be pronounced differently in older Spanish, but anyway. That uh, they knew that he had already printed his multi-volume polyglot, which included Latin and, and Greek and Hebrew and <coughs> things like that. 
And so you might go, well, if it's already printed and you're just now trying to get to print, how are you going to beat them? Uh, because why can't they just put it out? Well, the polyglot did not come out for a number of years. And the reason was uh, pretty, pretty simple. It was called bureaucracy. You had to have papal approval uh, to publish anything in the religious realm. So you might go, okay, well, he's still ahead of Erasmus in, the, in that process. So how, how could he beat him? Um, well, uh, Froben and Erasmus uh, chose to, to take a risk. Uh, Jimenez went, you know, he's, he's a cardinal, so he went the safe, proper route uh, as far as, you know, getting papal approval and stuff like that and the amount of time that takes, probably the amount of money that takes as well. And uh, Erasmus and Froben came up with the idea that they would go ahead and go to print and publication and distribution without papal approval. But they padded their chances by dedicating that volume to Pope Leo X. So it's, it's fascinating that if you um, look at uh, the first edition of what becomes the Textus Receptus. Uh, the first edition is dedicated to Pope Leo X. And that was sort of their way of hoping that that would be enough to keep them from jail or fines or the stake um, for, for publishing this. And of course, with the wild popularity you know, Erasmus didn't have to really worry much about, about money after that. Um, uh, with the wild popularity of his text and the next, next four editions after it, there were five total editions between 1516 and 1535, um, then it, you know, it, it worked out. And, of course, Jimenez's set would never have been a competition. Uh, Luther's is a single, I'm sorry, Erasmus's is a single volume you can carry with you. Um, Jimenez, you, you could carry with you if you had your donkey or a horse or something like that, I suppose. Uh, but it was multiple volumes and very heavy and, and cumbersome and so on. More for a scholar from, for his shelf than it was for uh, someone to carry uh, around. So uh, Erasmus's work was significantly more... Um, portable and useful to the reformers uh, as, as a result. And it was that first edition that Luther, that Luther had. So, so, so the, the very text from which Luther is going to begin to come to understand justification by faith up at the front was dedicated to Pope, Pope Leo X. So that's, uh, that's how that works. Okay, so with that, um, obviously when we start talking about the Reformation, we are doing so uh, you know, as, as Reformed Baptists frequently are, about six months late, um, <laughs> when you think about it. Um, but uh, uh, it's viewed very, very differently by different people. Obviously, uh, last year, uh, Catholic Answers uh, had a, uh, a conference over in San Diego around the same time as Reformation Day, um, uh, about how you know, you know, many many Roman Catholics will refer to it as the deformation, uh, not the Reformation. Uh, it's viewed as a rending, a, a ripping, a splitting of the faith. Um, uh, even if they admit there was need for uh, change, it had to be within the church, not by separating uh, from the church. Um, obviously, uh, Protestants in history, maybe not so much the main lines today, but in history view it as a revival, a recovery, a moving of the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the unshackling of the gospel, a return to a pure, more primitive form of Christian proclamation, a, a sweeping out of all the dust and the accretions of tradition over time. Uh, of course, the Marxists, as they view everything, uh, viewed it as a class struggle, uh, the Reformation uh, representing the lower classes fighting against the oppressive upper classes. Uh, you may note that that theme uh, can be changed from group to group 
quite easily and is in our land uh, even now, though sadly, uh, many of the millennial generation don't know what Marx, who Marx was or what Marxism is. Um, that's what happens with uh, many public education. Um, and then the, um, the secular view is that uh, this is just simply a part of the Renaissance movement, a, a necessary part uh, that uh, was inevitable and could have taken all sorts of different forms. It didn't have to take the particularly religious form that it did. And they will note, um, as we will note, that in many key points in the Reformation, um, and this may be uncomfortable to you, um, it was uncomfortable to folks on our tour last year in Germany when I kept bringing it up, um, <clears throat> that many major milestones in Reformation history uh, really came from a mixture of theological and political influences. Um, you simply can't separate out uh, the Reformation from what was going on around it. And um, uh, if, if you try to do, if you, if you present the Reformation as a wholly religious movement, you're going to end up with uh, car cartoon figures. Uh, Luther becomes a cartoon, everybody becomes a cartoon. It, it, it's no longer... You have to just start really ignoring a lot of the stuff that really happened uh, at that time. And so um, with that, believe it or not, uh, we move into the Reformation in Germany. Um, there are arguments. Uh, Zwingli would make the claim that, that he had come to these conclusions before reading Luther, but most people feel that um, really just on a chronological level and impact level uh, politically and everything else, uh, you, you really have to start with Luther. Uh, Zwingli is predominantly concurrent, but sort of a little bit behind uh, where, where Luther is as far as, and of course there are differences in the Lutheran and the Swiss um, reformations. Um, the background is that there was no national ruler in Germany. There was no single uh, individual who was, you know, there wasn't a king of Germany. Um, Germany was made up of uh, smaller subunits uh, such as uh, Saxony. And so they would have an elector and their electors would meet in diets, D-I-E-T-S, diets. Um, this would be the equivalent of our uh, Congress uh, or the Houses of Parliament. It's a legislative body um, that would meet um, every certain number of years or as the emperor uh, of the Holy Roman Empire uh, would uh, determine. And so this is a mixed form of government with lots of power struggles uh, between the, the electors uh, and the emperor. And, of course, the emperor would be uh, elected by the electors and so would, would himself almost always be a former elector himself. Um, there were uh, mixtures of, of kings in there, but uh, since this was considered what's called the Holy Roman Empire, uh, you know, the empire would need to have an emperor uh, as the, the head of that, uh, that empire, and sometimes that would be a king, and it all depended. It was very complicated, and it, it's not like there was... We're used to... We have a constitution, and that constitution is supposed to, supposed to determine how everything works. Well... There was no constitution. Things could change uh, depending on who had the biggest army uh, or whose city was getting hit by the plague worse than somebody else's city, basically. So there, things were um, a little bit variable there. Um, the elector of Saxony um, in the beginning of the 16th century was a man by the name of Frederick the Wise, Frederick the Wise, Elector of Saxony. He founded the University of Wittenberg in 1502. 
uh, barely over a decade before Luther first came there. Uh, so, uh, you know, you look at Wittenberg even today, uh, it's not that big of a place. And, uh, you know, when you, when you go by the uh, castle church there now, you have a cobblestone road, uh, which is a pain to run on. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's a pain to walk on, actually, uh, either, either way. Uh, you ever go there, bring very comfortable uh, shoes. Um, but even then, it's sort of out toward the, the, the boonies. There would have just been a dirt road, and there would have been cows wandering around, and, and um, uh, the river ran much closer to the... They, they, it's been diverted since the days of Luther, uh, and it ran very close to the... The village, as most villages needed, you need water, obviously. Um, and so, Wittenberg was was not your huge uh, metropolis at that time, and so to to begin a university there, uh, that university would have to um, struggle both to attract. Um, professors that would be well-known to then attract uh, students. Um, And so, to be honest with you, the the primary uh, reason that Frederick did this was personal. (laughs) Uh, He's an elector. He's a particularly powerful elector. Um, uh, Seems to have have been a wise man and and a, and a very judicious individual. Uh, didn't live a, a, an overly sumptuous lifestyle. Uh, he, he seemed to be a just ruler, uh, unlike many in that day. And, uh, but there was probably a little pride and ego uh, in the founding of the University of, of Wittenberg. And so when Luther does come there um, uh, to, to teach, it's, a, it's still a fairly young, young school. And keep in mind, uh, when people ask, why did Frederick defend Luther uh, when it was really not in his best political interests to do so? Uh, Frederick will die as a Lutheran, uh, but that's only toward the very end of his life. Um, he was very circumspect about, about these things because he was a part of the Holy Roman Empire, which was run by a Roman Catholic emperor. So... Um, it would be politically inexpedient uh, to be a Lutheran uh, early on. But why, why would he, for example, later on have Luther kidnapped and, and taken off to the Wartburg Castle and all the rest of that stuff we'll look at later? Um, uh, part of it, at least early on, when Luther, before Luther had really um, developed his theology, to a, a, the fullest extent. Part of it was just, hey, this is, this is my professor at my school, uh, and I think, for example, uh, Duke George, uh, who was one of Luther's lifelong enemies uh, after uh, the disputation in Leipzig, uh, Duke George is just one of my competitors, and he's just going after Luther t- t- as a means of going after me. Um, and so there was some of that, in, I think, in the background to keep in mind, um, that it wasn't necessarily so much a uh, dedication to Luther's theology, which had not yet even fully developed, but, hey, this is my, this is my university, <laughs> and he's my star guy, so I'm going to defend my star guy. And uh, I think that was, that was a, a, a part of, uh, of that situation at that time. Now, I'm trying to figure out, just thinking here, uh, how we're going to uh, do something. Obviously, uh, at some point over the next few weeks, I'm going to have to figure out how to uh, uh, set up the, the projector again. And um, I mean, I, I suppose I could skip this. Uh, and we could get done faster if I just simply sort of assigned um, as external work uh, for the class and just 
hope and trust that you would do so. Um, we've shown it on uh, New Year's Eve. Um, I, th- I think it's probably the, the easiest way to do this. Um, there, there are two or three videos that I would play in class. But computer technology is so ubiquitous now, uh, you could watch these on your phone for the vast majority of you. Um, but uh, the, the two videos, uh, I'll, I'll just give you one right now. Uh, they're all free on YouTube. So it's, it's not, not like you even have to go rent something. Or um, You know, when I first showed these videos, when I first taught this class, in the 1990s, uh, I was playing them on VHS cassette tapes. Um, and uh, most everybody in here remembers VHS, but um, uh, some of the very, very young folks might be going, I, I sort of remember hearing about that. But uh, um, anyway, um, the video that I would highly recommend, and it's only about an hour long, so it's not you know, some two-and-a-half-hour massive thing. Um, the video that I know is available on YouTube for free is the BBC production titled Martin Luther Heretic. Martin Luther Heretic. And there was a uh, uh, Martin Luther film done in 2004, which is about two hours, and is really good up until a certain point, and then it goes wacky as far as the time, uh, timeline goes, because they, had, I guess, they had to hurry up and finish it. Um, which, if you wish to watch that, that, that's fine as well. But Martin Luther Heretic uh, covers on, touches on pretty much everything we're going to be touching on in, in, in only an hour. It's very well acted, very well done. Um, the uh, the man who plays Luther, uh, pretty well known guy, used to used to what was it Mercedes or Lexus? I forget which of the two. Uh, he was a spokesperson for a number of years ago. But um, uh, if you can find the time uh, to view Martin Luther Heretic, um, that would would greatly enhance uh, the next couple of weeks of discussion, shall we say? Uh, you'll have sort of a visual background to some of the things that, uh, that we're going to be talking about. So when we talk about the, the relics in the castle church in Wittenberg, you know, you'll remember that one scene where, where once we get to Luther in front of Charles uh, at the Diet of Worms, you, know, you have that in your mind. Uh, it'll, it'll probably help things to stick a little bit more. Uh, and so, uh, yes, sir. I'd like to ask a quick question before you close this. Yeah, it's going to have to be quick. Go ahead. During that period, let's say from 11 to 1200 and on, so all the self-history, prior, during, and after the, informa- the Reformation, what happened to the Eastern Church? What's going on there? I mean, out of here, nothing. Did yeah. true to the truth? Were they corrupted? What's going on well, that, that is a very good question, uh, especially because uh, uh, the West's relationship to the Eastern churches comes up during the Reformation. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't cover that today, but um, uh, remind me uh, about that. It is, it is an important thing to discuss, especially what happened in the middle of the 15th century uh, at the uh, Council of Constance and the Eastern representatives and and stuff that um, uh, some of the relationships there, um, yeah, that, that that is definitely uh, something that I needs think, to be addressed. I think Greece had a pause because around 1400 to 1800, we were occupied by the Ottoman Turks. Right. Yeah, you're fi- you're, bi- you're fighting a war. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's 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 quite true. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we're late, but uh, we'll, we'll, definitely, uh, we'll definitely need to, need to address that. Okay, let's uh, close the word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to, once again, with freedom, uh, consider our past and our heritage. Uh, help us to remember these things, to be better servants of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.